everyone, and welcome to our October meeting of the Restoring Neighborhoods Task Force. I'm Rebecca King, a policy associate here with the National Housing Conference. We're going to go ahead and get started. We've got great presentations for you today. Per usual, though, before we dive into our content, I did want to give two quick policy updates. One is around appropriations, and I don't have a lot to say here. Um, we are watching things closely. The House and Senate are moving forward with their budget resolutions. The House began debating their budget resolution today. The Senate Budget Committee began marking up their resolution today as well. Um, but in terms of dealing with FY18 approach, we haven't seen any movement beyond the CR that ends December 8th. Um, so still pretty uncertain in terms of how FY18 spending gets resolved. Um, and what impact the budget resolutions have on FY on FY18, if any. Um, so they will be the vehicles for tax reform. Um, so there'll be lots to watch there. But, but there's not a lot to say specifically on appropriations right now. I also want to make sure everyone saw that nominations at HUD are moving forward. President Trump has announced his intent to nominate Brian Montgomery as Federal Housing Commissioner. So he's currently Vice Chairman of the Collingwood Group, but he previously served as HUD Assistant Secretary of Housing, Acting Secretary of HUD, and FHA Commissioner. He also assisted in the recovery and rebuilding from Katrina. So we'll be glad to see him get installed. President Trump has also nominated Suzanne Tuff to be HUD Assistant Secretary for Administration and Robert Kurt to be HUD Assistant Secretary for Public and Indian Housing. And in case you missed it, Pam Patton was sworn in last week as HUD Deputy Secretary. So glad to have her in place and getting started. And one quick mention of our solutions for affordable housing convening on November 29th. Early bird registration is available through October 13th. We've got lots of great panels and speakers, um, so you won't want to miss that. With that, I'm going to turn things over to Allison and pull up her presentation to talk about housing and education policy. Great. Thank you. Um, first, just thanks for having me here today. I'm really excited to be able to talk about this paper. Um, so the paper that I'm here to talk about is the latest um, research publication from Enterprise's uh, policy team it's called Creating Equitable Student Outcomes, uh, How Housing and Education Policy Are Inter Intertwined. And the focus of the paper is mainly on looking at um, racial and economic segregation in housing and also in schools and looking at how those two factors influence student outcomes. Um, it's a pretty long paper, and uh, so I'll just give a brief overview of it right now, um, but there should be a link to the paper um, on one of the slides here. So if you want to check that out, I really encourage it. Um, so before getting into the content of the paper, I just want to explain how this became a topic of interest for me and, and how it became a to topic of interest for the policy team at Enterprise. Um, so as uh, as housers, we've been uh, hearing a lot lately about how uh, residential patterns in this country are becoming more economically segregated and how um, poverty is becoming more concentrated. Um, the Century Foundation does uh, an annual paper every year that's really great. Um, the latest one shows that the number of high poverty census tracts, which are areas with populations um, with 40% or more of the population living under the poverty line, the number of those census tracts has increased 76% since the year 2000. And in those areas, the population has almost doubled from just over 7 million to almost 14 million. Um, and the majority, the fastest growing populations within those areas are households of color, primarily black households and Hispanic households. And uh, as most of us on the phone are more than aware, um, living in high poverty areas affects many parts of residents' lives, um, including uh, neighborhood safety, um, 
we talk a lot about health outcomes as well and disparities there, economic mobility, job opportunities, but also school quality and academic achievement. And um, so one statistic that kind of caught my eye for this paper was the fact that about 85% of all public school students in the U.S. still attend their neighborhood school. We hear a lot about school choice options and school lotteries, especially in cities and um, the places where uh, enterprise focuses on. But even in cities, the majority of students, um, of public school students, attend their neighborhood school, which means that um, where someone lives, where a child lives, um, really influences what schools they have access to. Um, so as we see neighborhoods becoming more economically segregated, that's also going to be mirrored in school populations that are um, at that neighborhood school. And when, uh, when we see neighborhoods becoming more economically segregated, we're often seeing them also become racially segregated, which is, again, mirrored in the schools. Um, according to recent data that was published by uh, the Government Accountability Office, the number of segregated schools, which they define to be schools where 90% of the students are low income and students of color, has doubled between 2001 and 2014. So we are seeing the number of segregated schools increasing along with um, uh, increasing segregated neighborhoods. So looking at these combined factors, I wanted to explore what the effects are of having racial and economic segregation, um, and particularly what the effects are, are low in on low-income students and students of color who are attending highly segregated schools. And I also wanted to look into how housing patterns influence school segregation, whether they play a role or not, and how housers can play a role in uh, better creating more diverse schools. So that was kind of the premise for the paper and the topics I wanted to explore. Um, so in, in starting to look into what the effects of segregation are in schools on academic achievement, I looked back at the process of school desegregation that took place through um, the second half of the 20th century. Um, it's a long and it's a complicated history with um, a lot of nuance, and so I just want to preface that before I say I'm going to give a very brief um, rundown of what I summarized in the paper, but as most people know, in 1954, the Supreme Court ruled in Board versus Board of Education, Brown versus Board of Education, excuse me, that uh, racially segregated schools were unconstitutional. So over the following decades, slow, very slowly in some cases, you see um, school districts being ordered by the courts to desegregate their schools. And uh, this integration process took place um, throughout that process, and it continued to increase until 1988. And at that point, nearly 45% of black students attended previously all white schools. Um, but that point in 1988 was actually the peak. Um, during the 1980s, the federal government, particularly the Justice Department, backed off of um, its enforcement role of this. And a lot of the courts began releasing school districts from their mandatory integration orders. As a result of that, schools began to resegregate. And unfortunately, much of the progress that had taken place during that period to integrate schools has been lost. Um, however, during that period, there was a lot of research that came out of it to show how, what the long-term effects were of students who were able to attend these integrated schools while they existed. Um, one, uh, one really kind of a uh, startling statistic is that prior to 1954, the academic achievement gap between black and white students was about 40 points. And during the 1980s, which was for the years of peak integration, that gap fell to 18 points, which is the largest drop that's happened um, in U.S. history. Additionally, there was a study by Rucker C. Johnson, who I um, really recommend you look up at the University of California at Berkeley. Um, it followed the long-term trajectories of students who attended integrated schools, and his research found that students who attended um, integrated schools compared to those who attended segregated schools 
showed increased educational and occupational attainment, um, attended higher quality colleges, had higher adult earnings, had better health status, and had a reduced probability of incarceration. Um, and the research al also showed that there were no negative long-term impacts on the white higher income students who had also taken part in, in the desegregation process. So, um, so really, a lot of the research really shows that, that there were some really positive outcomes for uh, the students who were able to access these schools at the time. Um, these findings are also consistent with research that exists today on diversity in schools. A large body of research today shows that students who are attending highly segregated schools generally have lower levels of academic achievement, lower graduation rates, but there's also research showing that those lower income students who are able to attend more economically and racially diverse schools um, have better academic outcomes than those who aren't able to access the schools. So the question kind of becomes, okay, so what, how does this concern housers? Well, we know that where a child lives affects where they attend school and how wealthy a community is often determines how successful the schools are. Um, we also know that federal housing policy, particularly mortgage policies, had an enormous impact on where families were allowed to live um, during the 20th century. Um, Richard Rothstein's book, The Color of Law, which I'm sure has been kind of making the rounds and um, does a really great job of kind of examining those policies and describing redlining and showing the lasting effects of when you allow only white families to live in certain areas and, and only allow um, families of color to live elsewhere, that that's going to have lasting impacts on where they're able to live and um, what neighborhoods they can access. Um, and so today, we don't have a lot of those policies anymore that were um, explicitly to segregate, but there are a lot of, lo especially local ordinances that exist that um, determine where people can live and where they can go to school. And a lot of those policies have racial implications. And so one that housers are pretty familiar with are exclusionary zoning policies, ones that don't allow rental housing to be built in often higher opportunity areas with good schools. That doesn't allow um, folks who make less money um, and oftentimes um, households of color to be able to access certain neighborhoods and therefore access the schools. Um, there are also a school district line and attendance zones that are drawn, often locally, um, that determine where students are able to access school. And unfortunately, there are a lot of examples today of um, school districts adjusting those lines in order to keep their school populations more homogenous, both, both um, racially and um, economically. There was a recent example in Alabama, I believe, that was highlighted by NPR. And uh, so, so that has a big effect on how, what schools the student can access. And then also property tax policy, because property taxes pay play such a large role in how much money a school has access to and how, therefore the quality of that school and the resources that they're able to have. Um, by relying on property taxes, obviously, the higher income schools are, um, the higher income neighborhoods are going to have better funded schools. So um, a point that I try to make in the paper is that local officials and mission-driven organizations in housing and community development um, if they're more aware of the impact of having racially diverse neighborhoods and therefore racially diverse schools, um, they can work to be more proactive in their work and to keep these academic outcomes in mind as they are um, going about their work in housing. Um, one example that I give is that in cities that are experiencing gentrification, um, some schools for the first time in cities are becoming more diverse. However, that diversity is often temporary because low-income households are often displaced. Um, sometimes it takes longer, um, but eventually that's usually the case. And so preserving affordable housing in gentrifying areas not only helps people remain in place, remain in their homes that they grew up in, but it also offers students 
um, a diverse learning environment, and that um, affects not just the students of color, but also the white students who might be coming into these neighborhoods, that they're able to learn in a more diverse environment. Um, affordable housing developers can also work to build, try to build in areas of high opportunity um, to open up better school options for lower income schools, um, for lower income students and students of color. Um, and developers can also work with their local school districts or their local charter school or whoever to ensure that residents that are living in their buildings are going to be able to access schools. And there are some examples in the country of um, housing developers working with a, a school and almost using it as an anchor institution to ensure that residents have access to the school and are able to um, kind of thrive. So um, all of this to say, racial diversity is by no means you know, a silver bullet of education, but um, research really shows that it can help move the needle. Um, and one last point I wanted to make that I also highlight in the paper is that at the federal level, um, HUD has its rule to affirmative, affirmatively further fair housing. This is something we've talked about a lot. Um, and while the current administration that we have is not, has not appeared as supportive of the goals of this rule as the previous administration, the rule still remains in place and HUD um, is still working with municipalities to identify barriers to fair housing and opportunity. And HUD includes in its data sets that it um, gives to municipalities data on academic achievement and school achievement. And so um, there is an opportunity for, uh, for jurisdictions to be able to reflect on uh, on their school quality and um, and how their their housing practices play into that. So, you know, just as Brown the Brown ruling had an, had an impact on school desegregation, um, these assessments completed by the AFFH rule could ultimately affect residency patterns. Um, so that's something. Obviously, this is still a new rule. It there are a lot of questions in the air about how this will be implemented by the current administration, but the fact that it still remains law is, is a good thing and, and could be a tool. Um, so I think that about wraps up what I wanted to highlight. Um, again, the, the paper is available online, um, so anyone who wants more detail or wants to learn more about this topic, um, I encourage you to read it, but also my contact information is there and that of um, Andrew, who's the head of our policy research department. So i um, happy to answer any questions you might have. I know that was a lot of information. I just threw it at everybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was great, Allison. Thank you. And if you haven't read the paper, do. It's really great. Um, if you do have questions, please send them uh, through the chat box. And I will pull up our next presentation while you're thinking about questions. I don't really have any because I did this paper and it was great and I think you did a good job of, as you said, the long and complicated history of school desegregation is, is difficult to wrap our brains around. Um, at NHC a while back, we read a book called Five Miles Apart, which mm -hmm. looked at a school in Richmond City versus just outside in Chesterfield County and the difference in property tax policy and neighborhood quality and what that meant for the schools was incredibly striking mm -hmm. um, and, and upsetting um, five yeah. miles apart. Yeah. Um, but I think it is how there's do have a role to play in changing some of that, um, but it's going to require some creative thinking and creative partnerships. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I think um, kind of the, the health and housing, I hate to call it a movement, but just the, the kind of link between health and housing that housers have been increasingly involved in, I think that this, that has really kind of paved the way for looking at other intersections and kind of looking at the, the education disparities between neighborhoods. And, um, and I'm hopeful that, that housers will continue to kind of work with, um, with other sectors and, and kind of um, taking down those silos. Yeah, uh, the paper, it's hard not for my brain not to go to purpose-built communities yeah, in Georgia mm -hmm. um, and how they went into a distressed neighborhood with a school of questionable quality mm -hmm. 
and then by creating a mixed income neighborhood, they made the school, it became the draw, and it did create yeah. a mixed income neighborhood, um, but it was a long-term strategy and a lot of work um, on multiple levels, not just building the housing. Um, yeah, they're a great example of, of kind of tying the two together. Yeah. Well, thank you, and I don't see any questions coming in, but uh, if you think of any folks on the webinar, feel free to send them, and we'll circle back to Allison, and uh, we will send out the slides with her contact information um, in case they occur to you later. So with that, I'm hoping Michael is on the line. Yeah, I'm here on the line. Yeah. Everyone can hear me. Great. Yes, we can hear you. So Michael Johnson is with us today. He's the VP of Global Philanthropy for J.P. Morgan Chase, and he's going to give an overview of their Pro Neighborhoods program. And after his presentation, we will switch gears to Mark Van Brunt with Raza Development in Arizona to talk about their work through the Pro Neighborhoods program on uh, transit-oriented development in Phoenix. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Michael. Great. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, so I just wanted to, um, to thank uh, Rebecca and the NHC folks for inviting J.P. Morgan Chase to the conversation. Um, I certainly, um, uh, everyone obviously knows the, the name of J.P. Morgan Chase in terms of us as a, as a business leader, um, uh, in global business leader. Um, but the philanthropy side is, is truly uh, looking to uh, really set a path uh, on its own. Um, really around reimagining and rethinking how uh, our philanthropic dollars can have a, an impact and, and really be a model of impact. Um, sort of tying into some of the conversations that my colleague just shared about um, uh, health, education, schools, and housing, um, in many ways, Chase is uh, not only looking to try to do work that uh, really changes the conditions of neighborhoods, um, but also looking to try to make sure that folks are included in this process, really getting people access to these opportunities. And so uh, we just don't necessarily believe that our grant dollars alone, um, you know, just in one year, last year, we, we gave up with $250 million annually. Now that's significant money to build capacity and to build uh, opportunities in all of our pillars within, uh, uh, within the, the, the markets that we serve. But truly, we are trying to think about how that can drive the conversation around more inclusive growth, um, really getting everyone opportunity and access to uh, uh, to the communities that they live in, communities that they're interested in, and obviously staying in. And so, on the philanthropic side, we are uh, um, we have one arm of the philanthropic side that that we promote uh, heavily, and that's called uh, Pro, which stands for Partnerships for Raising Opportunities in Neighborhood. Um, I think Rebecca, you guys, they should have the slides in front of them. Um, this, it's a lot of dense information, and and certainly don't want to sort of read through uh, um, all the content. But what I want to highlight is that um, you know J.P. Morgan Chase tests, learn, and inno innovate and iterate, and we we continue to try to do that within our within the lines of business, but we also do that in, in the in the global philanthropy team. So. The pro neighborhoods uh, uh, effort really came out of testing, and that test was done in a city like Detroit, where in fact we um, realized that it wasn't just dollars going into a city around brick and mortar, around housing development, around bringing other lines of business to support uh, small business development or provide even some workforce opportunities within that city, but it was really about a comprehensive uh, approach that leverages the strength of local organizations, particularly community development financial institutions, CDFIs, treasury-backed organizations that uh, have really been our, our risk takers and been on the ground for many years providing loans to, to people, to small businesses, building affordable housing, and doing a lot of that work. And so those two years of testing sort of, uh, 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 and, and, and the idea around what Detroit has done is providing a proof of concept of what you can do with uh, an institution that offers uh, both human capital but financial capital. This sort of led to to our launch in, in the Pro Neighborhoods, which is uh, our $25 million five-year commitment to addressing these quality issues in, 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 in neighborhoods around income, around wealth, and, and inequality. Um, we are in our fourth year of it. Um, 
and and just quickly do uh, uh, the pro neighborhoods. There are three sort of core areas um, that are are essential to making this work. Um, uh, the first two I'll I'll I'll, I'll highlight, um, which is an area that I actually spend a lot of my time focusing on nationally, and that is the, around the innovative housing financing models, which we use to uh, really increase and preserve affordable housing, connecting low and moderate income communities to resources. Um, but central to that is again not just about providing support, for example, to to Lyft or working directly in some of our markets in in the West Coast or in, in central area of the country or even in, in parts of southern parts of our country in Florida um, the affordable housing model is a way to try to create mobility um, we are working with organizations and HT and others to even think about how do you get get people access to high opportunity communities communities where um, there are great schools um, we understand, of course, that some, in some cases we want to be able to invest in places where you can ultimately, the school can uh, um, improve, the, the, the scores can improve, that students can actually um, uh, gain a quality education in an area that, of course, formerly did not have that. But we also believe and understand that, that, that clearly there, there is uh, opportunities for us to uh, get people access to that. And so a lot of the work that we're considering, a lot of the research that we're looking to do around uh, uh, this effort of mobility definitely ties to housing, but it's more than that. It's about making sure that people get access to that. So we will provide um, uh, planning grant support to that effort. We also will, will help to uh, uh, be uh, in some ways, a credit enhanced to to some of the funds that are being established to to do a lot of this work across our our markets and and in in our states that we we have a presence. Um, the research part in data goes back to this idea of reimagining what we are as a as as a philanthropic organization. We don't think we just want to produce research reports that say we sponsored it and it was something that folks have access to and can study and read and and, and learn from. But we hope that the actual research that we uh, produce does uh, get filtered to the point of, of, of the data leading to some kind of action. That action being, for example, that, that data about housing uh, conditions or at least uh, rent, rent, rental conditions in a place or, or looking at the, uh, really the state of, of, of land um, uh, supply or, or, or vacancies in a, in a location through, through data or mapping exercises could give a local community development corporation an edge to really try to understand how it can uh, maybe look to ultimately acquire some of these properties and think about ways of, of, of uh, really positioning its land to preserve uh, affordable housing, build affordable housing. In some other ways, it, it's also a mechanism for us to engage all of our partners um, uh, in the local level um, to get them to think about uh, where the data uh, can can be done to um, really enhance um, the effort towards uh, looking at communities in a different way, looking at the trends that are coming, um, and in some ways creating opportunities for people to figure out what the policy tools they can they can use in order to to, to, to drive uh, uh, efforts around inclusive and, and equitable development. Um, so those two are the two core areas that are that are that are critical in the pro. The one I want to sort of highlight. Um, uh, really, uh, uh, in, in the next slide, and I don't know, uh, Rebecca, if you're new to that, is focused around our uh, annual competition, which we're calling uh, the CDFI Collaborative Competition and Peer Learning Program. Part of the pro neighborhoods, the, uh, we uh, made a concerted effort to think critically not only about uh, ways of thinking, think, thinking and, and addressing economic disparity and social and housing disparities, but we thought, where could this land? Where could we put our monies to build capacity for organizations to do this work? Um, and again, the driver um, uh, around this that we've, we've noticed through our research and our, our conversations and the engagements we've had across the markets are our CDFIs. And so through the annual competition, we have created opportunities for CDFIs to break silos. Um, many, as you, I'm sure folks on the phone um, and been in this business in a while, that oftentimes community development can be siloed. 
Um, you, ha you have folks who really don't want to work together, who may not want to coordinate on an issue. You may have several CDCs in one, one, one city that have never talked, never communicated, never thought about how they can leverage each other's capacities or dollars. And so the competition really helps to uh, put on notice that in order for neighborhoods to change, in order for uh, 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 folks to receive access to small business loans or in combination with uh, uh, building and financing uh, affordable housing, we needed to make sure that there were true collaborations happening across the board amongst the uh, community development organizations and CDFIs. The CDFIs are the leading uh, um, uh, part of it because, again, of their balance sheet and their ability to move money uh, more nimbly than than, than than most, but also what's important is that they've identified partners who really can target certain geographies, they can look at certain neighborhoods that are on the rise, and neighborhoods that, that need to be invested in. And so the collaborative really is a model for growth and expansion. And we successfully really over uh, the last few years have identified great organizations, one of, one of which you'll, you'll, you'll hear about um, today. Um, and tied to sort of, again, the research, you know, Joint Center for, for, for Housing Studies, Harvard has been, been our partner in sort of tracking this and cataloging and putting together information that we can share with the general public. Again, if you look at the, the, the deck, really, we've, we've invested in, in um, CDFIs alone, I've uh, invested almost $320 million, um, uh, leveraging almost $550 million in, in outside capital. That has netted affordable housing uh, on the on uh, the size of 2,700 units of that and and, and generated 6,800 uh, uh, jobs. And so we think the power of capital, the power of our dollars um, can go a long way um, to help a community development financial institution and, and other partners in that effort to build their capacity. But what I think is also essential is that we want to use that model so that going forward, these organizations no longer think it is uh, um, unusual to partner on a project, that it's not unusual to, to collaborate on an initiative that uh, provides businesses uh, opportunities for both space and financing, that looks at very creative, innovative ways to look at problems that we see locally that these CDFIs know well, and that we as a bank, of course, may not have the same lens. lens. Um, one of the other points I want to sort of add to this conversation is that this year in particular, um, what's been most important to us and what has come across our, our tables uh, um, more frequently is this idea of peer learning. Um, we've discovered that in this year alone, the competition that we had, uh, we, we have recently awarded uh, $16 million for collaboratives um, focused on inclusive communities. The competition was very tight. In fact, the the, the runners the runner ups, uh, you know, the organizations that we uh, we were looking at, there were nearly almost 25, 26 uh, applicants, um, and of the finalists, uh, we had a tough time figuring out, you know, where we would want to land, you know, in terms of uh, providing not only the grant support but 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 some efforts to. Uh, really uh, move the needle on some of the work that, that the CDFIs are trying to do. So the peer learning capacity building was something that was critical to us. And this year in particular, what we've done is identified uh, what I might call honorable mentions, uh, folks that really didn't get the, the, the larger uh, pot of funding funding for, uh, you know, for the CDFI competition. But we've identified partners in, in our central, and some places in our West Coast uh, CDFIs who may not have uh, won the big prize, but at the end of the day, we saw something in their proposal and in their collaborative work that we thought needed to be uh, um, given uh, support, uh, at least from uh, uh, technical assistance or some type of, of, of level of, of, of uh, um, training or, or, or guidance so that even if they had decided to run, uh, to run, to compete again next year, they may not have won or may decide not to and continue on with the work that they're doing. We thought that providing that level of, of uh, extra support to those CDFIs was, was crucial given the story that they told, given the problem that they so eloquently 
uh, and passionately are, are looking to, to do. And we clearly saw that they were on the ground already working and we wanted to support that. And so really in closing, um, you know, our pro neighborhoods uh, focuses to incentivize community development, community organizations really to, to break those silos. You know, we want to make sure that our, our monies are, 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 are really provided both locally and regionally. There's been conversations and there have been grant proposals recently have, have looked beyond a, a, a neighborhood and gone to multiple neighborhoods and gone, in some cases, multiple cities, um, given the, the, the capacity of the CDFI and the partners that they're working with. Um, so we're looking at that. Um, we want to really enhance the reach and sustainability of the CDFIs. We want to give them a name. We want to give them a reputation for the work that they already have been doing for a number of years and build that up. Um, our focus, again, continues to be consistent around low and moderate income families. Um, we also, uh, and you know, I'm on the housing side of, of the equation, but my, my colleague, Colleen Briggs, who runs the competition, she focuses on financial capability. We also have a team that focuses on small business um, development. So we also focus on entrepreneurs of color. We focus on uh, distressed neighborhoods to where we see that are being impacted uh, through uh, gentrifying forces um, that might change the social conditions of these places over the next five to 10 years. Um, we also want to sort of make sure we sow into leadership. Um, this is a business, of course, that's very, uh, 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 an old business where there are folks that have been in this, in this practice for some time. And we want to make sure that, that we're funding and supporting the leadership that's in place, but new leadership that, that's looking to do something innovative. And I think lastly, um, we want to be in a position where we're sending a message about equitable growth. Um, we just, again, don't want to be in a position to, to give dollars that provide this kind of support and capacity. But we also want to be the kind of institution that uh, can invite others and attract others to come into those conversations, whether they're additional banks, institutions, uh, anchor institutions, um, uh, philanthropic organizations, so that we all can, in some ways, continue to move the needle on this model for impact to reimagine communities and make them more inclusive and equitable. So with that, uh, and it was sort of succinct uh, uh, proposal there, but and presentation, but. Um, look forward to, to getting any questions that you might have. Thanks so much, Michael. And we have we have one question, and I think I'm going to give it to you now as opposed to waiting, and then we'll dive into Mark's presentation because of just the nature of the question. So in your work um, on pro-neighborhoods, have you seen uh, grantees, collaboratives do work on single-family residential, both rental and home ownership? And if so, what have you guys learned from, from that? Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, yes, in fact, we have one more recent wardy that that's that's uh, you probably get to hear more about um, in the LA market that's focusing on that same kind of work. Um, one of the things we discovered, um, and I'm based in New York, so I have some of the New York uh, portfolio under my belt as well, is this idea of uh, we see obviously a stream of of inc an increase in the rental market side. Uh, in fact, that pressure is putting pressure on on those uh, high cost cities and driving some people out um, given the high cost of rents. We still feel quite secure um, around our giving and our efforts around not only uh, cities where there are opportunities for home ownership, older cities like New York and other places, West Coast and, and, and South, but we're also focusing on our rural communities as well, which there has been a presence. Um, what we've learned, um, which I think is quite exciting, is that tied a little bit into our financial capability pillar, is that there is opportunity for what we're calling naturally occurring affordable housing in the realm of home ownership, uh, accessory apartments, accessory unit apartments. In New York, you might equate those to being basement units, uh, which are not in code, which um, there has been a blue ribbon committee in New York trying to think about how do we put up to code uh, basement units so homeowners can keep their homes at the same time, uh, provide some affordable rents to new renters or, or, or newcomers coming into neighborhood. In California, it's quite different, even though the concept's the same, uh, more land, but these sort of uh, second homes or odd homes, uh, uh, smaller homes on lots are also being considered. And so we do have a, a partner that most recently we have awarded a grant to explore uh, that part of, of uh, housing that does 
not only consider rental, but also consider the idea of, of preserving some home ownership, because we all know that that stability in a neighborhood is not just about its renter population, but it's about people who've lived in the communities um, and have been homeowners for a number of years. And so we can find a way to maintain that level of home ownership, even if not at the higher levels that we've had in the past, that does sort of create a sound and stable, stable community. Great. Thank you. And again, as, as folks are thinking, um, feel free to send questions. We're going to shift over to Mark, but then we'll open for more general Q&A at the end. Um, and I'm sure I will have some questions then as well. Uh, so thank you, Michael. And then, uh, Mark, let me just pull up your presentation. I see it. Mark, are you? Good. Yeah, All right. I am here. So, uh, I'm Mark Van Brunt with the uh, Rasa Development Staff here in Phoenix, and the Chief Operating Officer, and have had a, a a major role in, in um, managing this with uh, the team in here, and well, also with the CDFI Collaborative. And so, I want to be able to. I hope hope to be able to touch on on so much of what Michael's expectations were for a uh, grant like this because uh, they really did uh, materialize for us. I think it'd be most what I've got is enough, uh, some slides that will take you through. I hope of the dimensions of interventions and impact that we've been able to do with this uh, investment, and it really was an investment. Um, there was no personnel. Uh, expenses in this. It was all investment capital of different kinds uh, that we think really helped us uh, to do this and really make it a legacy grant for us that's going to keep on going uh, beyond the end of the grant. So in a, in a historical context, I would tell you this grant, um, for the, the three to four years that preceded this grant were, was the worst single family crash in the history of of the state, especially all of Maricopa County. And unfortunately, it led to a, a big um, swath of investors coming in and pulling up a, a lot of this, uh, um, a lot of these units. And <clears throat> it, it, for, it created some years of real confusion about where opportunity could be on that. Unfortunately, it was so big that it was really hard to be able to do but just a few, say, but a few units. What did emerge is it the Phoenix, which is not known for mass transportation, as you all may know, uh, began to had completed a light rail system that went from sort of east to west and north to south, or mostly north to south. I mean, the, the south, southern extension is what I'll talk about. And that, that light rail opportunity really opened up um, a, a lot of ways in which we can invest. And so the first slide, if hopefully you can pick it out and I'll take you for a tour of what the the eastern leg of this uh, light rail transit um, map, the map that you have in front of you is some of the opportunities that really emerge for us to sort of work in a community that historically, um, I would say, was opposed to affordable housing and a lot of the, um, and really dealing with the, you know, the, the growing diverse community there. And so it was a combination of uh, part of what you, you can see, there's these, the Escobedo uh, Apartments, which was built on the site of a pre-war camp where most Latinos um, worked uh, in that era. And it was largely how they came to the area. In the middle of this renovation is still some of the original units and even Quonset huts. Um, that are now community space and actually have historical pictures in them. So that we were able to work with the developer for the uh, preservation, but also the, um, the, the uh, development of is the development that you see there. One of the things that became apparent and it's been replicated is that uh, only half the families in these units, and it's a tax credit unit, uh, with a number of other subsidies. Only half the families have automobiles. And it was one of the major attractions to this is that they could get now get around to employment in other parts of the valley 
and particularly in central Phoenix, and without having each of them having a car. Um, a trend that we noticed as well with you see at the other end there is La Mesita, which was a development of the uh, New Leaf uh, organization. It's everything, uh, what you see there is obviously family housing, but it's also for, for uh, uh, homeless veterans. It was, it's a collection simply because, frankly, the city over the years fought such housing, and this organization did um, really got the job done, and we've been able to do some of the pre-development funding for them. Ironically as well, they um, have more, yeah, they have become a, a CDFI in their own right. We had a small business CDFI as part of our collaborative in Mesa, and they have been, essentially there was a merger, uh, and I'll be mentioning a couple of those in, in the context of, you know, how do we do as a CDFI uh, collaborative. So it, what you also see here is that we were um, instrumental in, in uh, financing the relocation of a what was a farm worker clinic. It's called Adelante Healthcare Farm Worker Clinic historically in the West Valley, and it, they relocated here to serve the Latino population and the low-income population in the West Valley, and that's the as you see Adelante Healthcare. Um, in, in the other thing here that was pretty unique is that about seven, eight years ago, the mayor put out a, a broadcast nationally to universities, um, the small, smaller ones, private ones, if they wanted to come to Mesa and really serve the whole population, um, they would open up space for them and actually give it to them. And so it was a national competition. And so Benedictine University in in Chicago uh, was successful with that, and they really have made a concerted effort uh, to begin to work with um, a lot of the Hispanic population, especially in the West Valley and, and even beyond in, in some of the rural areas, as a way of getting uh, them in to, to, uh, into the university and, and to be able to stay there. It's been a combination of, we've actually have been able to raise some scholarship dollars to make some of that happen. And in combination that I mentioned, you know, housing, especially in terms of students, is that it was really a problem about how those who couldn't commute um, could get affordable residential. And so what you have there on, in the middle um, is a hundred year old hotel, about a block and a half, two or three blocks from the, the university that we were able to uh, finance the conversion to that into um, um, basically rooms and some facilities to support very, very affordably about 60 students, and that was leased to the university. And so there's other things that are going on here, but it's, uh, this is some of what we were able to do on the scale that we did, um, you know, largely because of this investment. Let's move on to the, uh, to the next slide. What is this? This is the, um, these are advocates in, uh, from South Phoenix. And the, and the real, the other real air area of emphasis is South Phoenix. South Phoenix is a, in some ways this was a, <clears throat> this was an initiative that was about a, a tale of two cities. Uh, you'll see, and we'll see in the next slide, but hold, holding this one is that there is, um, this is a, an area that is just two miles from downtown, and yet it's a world away. All the statistics are half, be it income, be it age, you'll see that in a minute. Um, and in particularly, it's also a place where there is a, as you've maybe heard of Arizona, that um, immigration, particularly mixed immigration families, are really a phenomenon here, where one of the breadwinners is still in the process of trying to get you know, get uh, citizenship. And we've had um, a very aggressive sheriff who was voted out, fortunately, recently, uh, a very aggressive uh, sheriff who was really be making um, a, a lot of just high you know, profile uh, arrest, was indicted by a federal judge. And as you might have read recently, that uh, President Trump um, commuted his sentence um, and so things have settled down, and yet 
this is really an area that is very, very different. It's very historically Hispanic, although it's um, it's about 10% Afro American as well. It has really been a, a struggle to be able to get that for their needs to be heard. And so this is a group called Promise Arizona, part of a coalition that we have worked with. Uh, that thanks to this um, pro neighborhoods grant, they are you know, very trusted you know, community organizing. Uh, entity in South Phoenix, and they surveyed nine, over 900 houses, and homes, and businesses to really give us a sense about what was needed in South Phoenix. Next slide. Um, some of the stats, like two things of immediate note is, uh, first of all, the, the, the map in the middle is, as you see, the sort of the uh, violet era area down there is downtown Phoenix, and that um, that river is not really a river, although it's somewhat riparian in places. It's a big wash, uh, and and historically been a polluted one, and so that's the that's the um, uh, the line you see is Central Avenue that goes over to South Phoenix, the area uh, I've been talking about. As you can see, some of the the demographic and economic uh, stats here is that uh, you know poverty and household income, um, you know again, uh, extremely. This is uh, where a majority of the poor really do live, at least in, especially in some concentration, and, and incomes are half. You know, 40 percent are under the age of 25. Um, 70 percent don't have a license to drive. You know, once again, only one car. Um, for half of the families there, um, and 85, nearly 85 percent um, minority, with 70 percent more or less uh, Hispanic, and the rest Afro American. Um, the thing to be either the, one of the initiatives that we were able to um, move to a, into higher gear because of this award was to get a a the light rail system to include this as, as the green line you see is this is the next line to South Phoenix. The highest level of transit use, buses, uh, is just what you're seeing there. Is that people, the people who live in South Phoenix and go north into the uh, other parts of, of Phoenix for work. And so this line is going to be absolutely critical and because of some of the advocacy work and work with you know, the city, uh, that's been moved up by about five years. And so right now, the Department of Transportation has already released the first contracts for um, alignment, uh, purchase, and design. And the groups that you saw demonstrating in front of the Capitol are actually uh, in, in the contract in terms of ensuring community involvement uh, in this process. Go to the next one. So one of the things that we, this is along the that um, that same route on Central, uh, with schools. There is uh, the schools have been notoriously sort of underperforming, and there have been some um, some charter schools, particularly one in particular that's done a very excellent job with uh, there's been a couple of them we were able to finance both of them and this is one that was a ymca that south phoenix um uh, 15 20 years ago rallied to get built the board of the y about a year ago uh, decided a little more right in the middle of the grant um decided a kind of clandestinely to sell the building to the highest bidder and do it on short notice. Um, something that the community was up in arms about, what to do. Um, thanks to this grant, we were able to organize financing for this in three days and take it off the table. And here you have the finished product. And so this is one of two charter schools. Um, one, one charter school was able to locate in this, and we have another one that we were able to fund uh, as well. I think the the other thing about this whole area in South Phoenix was this partnership we had with this, with Marisol, which is a CDFI credit union, 
um, we had not done a lot of work together. And this is, a, a, I would say this grant really helped bring us together. We have used explicitly throughout this, both both of the housing, but also on some of the commercial and, and consumer lending that really wasn't happening, is to be able to work with something, uh, an organization like Marisol to craft some new products that dealt not just with um, sort of payday um, loans that were um, more equitable, fair and priced, um, but also uh, and use cars, which people re really need and they need to get it unsecured. So we, we did a number of consumer loans that um, have added up to um, you know, several million of new you know, consumer credit to folks. That's also included um, um, loans to families for immigration expenses. And then we've also um, moved into doing um, student loans for dreamers. That's another uh, political football that goes on, but that relationship with Marisol continues to go on and we will continue to um, work with the uh, work with the organization to to devolve, evolve more and more consumer products that really make sense for the community that they that largely has been only partially banked or in some cases uh, um, unbanked. And so it's uh, it's that we see this is going on as long as we have the, the funds from the grant to be able to um, to do some of the enhancements that are necessary. And I do get a call from NCUA um, to ensure that we're still around and they can make good in our part of the bargain. So um, I and then the last slide is the one that's most aspirational and still in the works. And this is what and called Plaza de las Culturas. This is, gives you, uh, if you, if you remember the previous slide, there's that wash, is what we call them out here, um, that separates South Phoenix from um, South Phoenix from from uh, downtown Phoenix uh, proper. And we had brought this this parcel uh, along with work, working with the city, working with the owner of Semex, a Mexican company that had run a rock quarry on it. Um, and and it has been a a long effort that is not it's that's still in uh, in play um, to be able to to uh, have this as a um, a site that is not just multicultural but uh, multi-purpose in terms of land use. And so uh, we've done a lot of environmental work, uh, talked with a lot of investors. Um, the city is still you know working with us on some infrastructure improvements in there. And again, the light rail would go right uh, on, uh, as you see, the red line of uh, Central Avenue. So that's still a work in progress. It's, it's something that we never would have thought possible, but for the sort of the size of this grant and the, you know, some of the opportunities we could shoot for and, and the, the impact that we could have and normally even not think about it. So that, <clears throat> that will happen. Uh, Senator McCain is very interested in that part of his legacy. And so that, uh, that in fact, um, goes on. So I, I think I'll leave it there. I would tell you that, uh, again, we've really seen this as a sort of a legacy investment in this community. We're going to keep on doing what we can. I would tell you, and as we, though we were able to um, deal with about nine multifamily projects that are all um, affordable, about 700 units, that's gone. The, we are now in a multifamily bubble of some very, you know, what is now turned into um, unbelievable for us, you know, eight and 10 story luxury rentals along the light rail. And so it's been completely, completely gentrified. We were fortunate to be able to have this capital to move when we could to get the affordable units. Um, and so the, the uh, timing for that, but this grant was perfect for us. Again, I think we see it as a legacy investment. The, the, I think the last thing I'd say is that um, we had those two other CDFIs that were working with us on small business. One of them was subsumed into one of our borrowers uh, and is doing a good job with, with uh, small business assistance, and, and especially in the East Valley. 
we're going to uh, we have been organizing and working with our, our local Chase um, you know foundation representative here to begin to help some of the small business owners in South Phoenix that have very different um, very distinct sorts of demographics uh, a lot of them are unbanked or underbanked but are from running successful businesses and need a very special kind of um, some products some underwriting criteria even some help to basically get them their books in order and and um, and even there are some citizenship um, um, difficulties that are being that we think can be could be resolved under I-10, the I-10 program. But also, uh, the light rail is a is a great boom, but it's also going to have some real um, negative externalities, if you will. And that is, there's going to be a lot of dislocation because of the alignment and the the, uh, the, you know, the city fabric. And so, uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of businesses are going to get uh, Know, forcibly moved by this. It hasn't been taken up in any of the federal money that's in this, uh, in the Department of Transportation planning grants. And so that's, we're going to move forward with that to be able uh, to do a pilot, um, a small business pilot in South Phoenix is sort of the next, uh, the continuing of this grant. And I'll leave it at that. Thanks so much, Mark. That was great. Um, to get a real sense of the, the depth and breadth of what you've been able to do with the Chase investment um, through Pro Neighborhood. Uh, again, folks, if you have questions, please send them. I think one thing I'm wondering is you mentioned the CDFIs you've worked with, the community organizing group. How did you build those partnerships? How did you choose kind of who would be part of your collaborative effort? Some of it was in play. Um, the, w there's always been a concern and, 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 you know, our, you know, our CEO is a longtime resident and leader in South Phoenix. And there's always been this concern about this other, you know, this, this other city that's down there that, that gets uh, short shrift on all manner of, uh, you know, public resources. And so, um, he, through his leadership, Thomas Spinoza, and, and part of what we do here is to sort of try and elevate these community conversations and get them into City Hall and into the hands of some of our legislators our, and our congressmen as well. And so that's that was in play, but really, um, ele it really ele this grant really elevated those political conversations, frankly, and. You know, sometimes, um, you know, a lot of the, a lot of folks our age, my age, um, think about that's about all we did about 30, 40 years ago was community organizing. And so, I, you know, we're back in the business in a different way, but to be able to make an impact as a player and with other players, such as the other CDFIs and these community groups, to be able to take this uh, to a new level and I, I would tell you that we're getting heard, and I think that's why some of the progress that uh, it, um, that we hope to have, I, we do think will materialize because of the, frankly, the, the political capital that we now have uh, from all this activity. That's great. It's great when we can find an effective way to lift up distressed communities and get them some of the attention. Yeah, they and, Re and Rebecca, we would be uh, certainly open if somebody just wants to, to email me, and we, we we I would be glad to have a conversation um, with them on 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 the project, but also the just the possibilities that are there with this uh, these pro neighborhood investments. Um, there, there's such unique opportunity, and like I say, for us, we're um, we're going to keep moving with this investment and doing what we can with it, and it's um, it's going to be with us a while, and and it's such a unique opportunity. So I'd be, be glad, we'd be glad to really talk with anybody offline or follow up um, who's online would like to have that conversation. Well, that's great. Thanks, Mark. We'll be sure to share your contact information in case folks want to reach out. 
Um, I think one thing we all do a lot of thinking about, but especially now, um, is creative financing, innovative financing, and uh, effective partnerships because federal government resources are continually more and more limited, it seems like. So getting changing communities on the ground really takes programs like Pro Neighborhoods to move the needle, at least at the local level. Um, so I'm not seeing other questions come in. Let me double check. I don't want to hold people. Okay. Well, I just want to thank Allison and Michael and Mark. This was so great. I learned so much, and I know that everyone on the webinar did too. Um, we will send out notes and resources to everyone. Um, and just thanks so much for joining, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you as well. Take care, Rebecca. Bye. Bye now.